Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is real life. Once again, welcome to the hit show. A story is written by a current prisoner with your favorite journalist, Tony. It ain't going to slow down, ladies and gentlemen. Not even the slightest bit. Ladies and gentlemen, genuinely, from the deep down bottom of my heart, I, I strongly appreciate you guys, man. Some of you guys have been on this journey with me for years already, man. It's been one hell of a ride, and sincerely, man, I appreciate you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize that it took so long to finally upgrade this, you know, this enhanced audio system. However, ladies and gentlemen, here we are, and I can assure you, I can promise you that from here on forward, each and every individual that I come in contact with, it will be top notch audio. There's a lot of interviews, there's a lot of people who I've come in contact with that I have interviews set up with that I've been postponing until I had upgraded this audio system. However, it's upgraded, here we are, and uh, be on the lookout for those new interviews, man, because it's going to be, you know, nothing but juiciness. With that being said, this interview itself that you're about to listen to, unfortunately, it has not been done with this uh, enhanced audio. However, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just, uh, just know that it ain't going to slow down, not even the slightest bit. So here we are. Let's go ahead and rock this thing. All right, big powder, sir. Go ahead and do your thing, sir. Uh, you know, we've been rocking on this channel for a long time, for like a few years now. And it's like 8 o'clock tonight, and I'm on the third tier of Soledad. And it's crazy because I'm looking out the window down right in front of my cell is like the stairs that go down to the second tier, down to the first tier. And then you can look out, out the window and see like these little old yards, like old school yards because this place is like a little museum and as I look out this little windows right I'm sitting here just tripping on how everything has evolved in prison and how I have the ability at eight o'clock at night to be able to get onto this platform and share these stories and experiences from inside the hole because there was a time in this hole in the hole when I first came into prison where you couldn't even have an appliance you couldn't have no TVs, no radios, no nothing. So I'm just super grateful to be able to come up on his platform from inside my cell and deliver some really top-notch stuff. And it's crazy, too, is because every guy that's up on this platform is delivering the best of the best. And, and I want people to understand that telling these stories and sharing these stories isn't just nothing. It's it, The significance of what we're sharing and uh, this lifestyle and everything like that it's real purposeful. So I hope everybody really appreciates the stuff that we deliver on this channel because we deliver the best. We've been rocking. And I want to take a little quick minute too to, you know, say thank you to a certain somebody who gave me my purpose. And without her, without this person, I wouldn't be here today to even get on this platform at 8 o'clock at night and share my experiences. But this person never gave up on me, and she was there when I was in Pelican Bay, isolated, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where all we had was waiting on a, a, a mailman at 4 o'clock, up there in a dungeon, isolated permanently, and that's where I was at with my life. And all of us that were there, we were all validated Aryan Brotherhood members, associates, MA members and associates. And at 4 o'clock, you have nothing, because we were permanently in the shoe. We were isolated permanently so we're up there in this dungeon and every single day we'd wait on mail call at four o'clock and the mailman he'd walk by and all we had to look forward to was letters and every day without fail this person the mailman would come to my door and say hey Cummins you got a letter here you go and I would look outside of my door before he even handed me the letter and it would be certain colors of envelopes blue purple yellow red whatever it was and I knew exactly who it was and I grabbed the envelope and I would see right there on the address, and they would say Cassandra Klein or Cassie Klein, and I'd start smiling, okay? And I would open this, and every single letter would start off the same way. Hey, crazy, what are you doing in your little box? I hope you get out one day. I hope you get out of the shoe one day, and I hope that you end up changing your life so you can come home one day because I didn't have purpose. And every single day, I could look forward to that. So... This, I, just, I just owe a thank you to her, and I just wanted to say that's why I'm so grateful, and that's why I am the way I am, because without her helping me find my purpose and being able to use this platform as a contribution, because that's what it is, and I know my purpose, I wouldn't be able to do that without her. I would be dead or in prison. That's not an assessment. That's a fact. So I'll take you all the way back from Calipat 
into the lifestyle that we were living when I first came in. And I don't know how many viewers, there's a lot of people that view this channel and you hear all kinds of crazy war stories from murders to attempted murders to power struggles to people getting shot out on the streets, stabbed on the streets, whatever. Now, I don't know how many people have actually received word, whether it was verbally or it was written down on paper. You know, back then they were called kites, and you would usually, you know, pop this little balloon, and once you pop the balloon, then you've got to unwrap like four or five layers of plastic. After you undo the plastic, then you get to the little tied-up strings, and you've got to untie the strings, and it'll be this little tiny piece of paper and back then, we had to perfect and practice being able to, on a line piece of paper, write four to five lines and get the uh, instructions done within four to five lines between one line to the next line. These kites are about the size of a Tic Tac. Now, when you get these things, they're called hot. It's called hot mail. And I remember the first time I popped my balloon and I, I received a kite. It was a hot kite, and it was a murder kite, and I opened it up. And when you receive this type of information, whether it's, like I said, verbally or on paper, you get this sort of feeling over your body because now you know that things have just got real. And in the lifestyle that I was living and the lifestyle that everybody was living in, because like I was talking about Prison of Evolved, it's not like this anymore about what I'm about to share because these things are considered snail mail. So when you open it, and you get the contents of this kite, and it's usually in red pen writing. The way that the brothers would do it is usually it'd be in red pen writing once you got to it. And it'd be just five lines on the front, five lines on the back, the size of a tic-tac, and it would be cut to the chase, straight to it. We want so-and-so handled. There's no if ands, or buts about it, and it's a murder kite. And now you're in a position to where you have to either take the responsibility to get the job done, and the way that they would do this, the way that they would select people back then, it was considered snail mail. So on these yards, we would have to get roll calls on each yard and send it through the ad segs. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. <laughs> Going on missions, whether they were stabbings or whatever, and they make their way to the shoe with these little kites, whether a Sudeño or a white boy was catching a ride to the shoe. Some of these kites and roll calls that we would send to the shoe to the brothers would take six, seven, eight, nine months, sometimes a year, two years, and been up so many. By the time they get it, it smells. It's been, you know, they really go to extreme lengths and measures to to communicate because back then they didn't have cell phones like that. Everything was on paper. So the brothers, they would receive these roll calls from the shoe and they would open up these roll calls and these roll calls would consist of people's names, first and last name, their CDC number, their AKA, you know, and that way they can narrow it down on who's on their yard, who needs to go, and how they're going to go. And who do they have that's responsible enough and determined enough to get the job done? And let me tell you something. When instructions come down from the brothers or the MA or whatever the faction is, there's a big difference between hurting somebody and making sure that their heart stops, making sure that their soul leaves their body permanently. So when you get this kite and you get to the very bottom of it and you untake that last little spot and open it and it's so-and-so needs to be killed, get it done, that's when you know things get real. And we had a hitter. We had a hitter right there. And there was an individual who had been slipping through the cracks for a long time, and it took a few years. Like I said, back then it was considered snail mail. So a person can go from yard to yard, move from shoe to shoe, and kind of maneuver, and it'll take three, four, five, six years for it to catch up to them. But let me tell you something. It always catches up to that person. Now, one of my homeboys, we received this kite where an individual needs to be taken out. And there's only certain reasons that a person will have those instructions. The orders will come down only for certain reasons, whether a dude is a considered a piece of What I mean by a piece of shit, he's, he's told on somebody, which is ratting, he's a or he's rolled it up off yards and he has made contact with IGI, those labels right there, that will get you a murder hit on you. 
period, or if you're STB, which is considered a brand. Anybody who's all the way full throttle against the AB, that'll get you a death sentence as well. So there was an individual through monitoring, and I remember specifically this kite took a long time to get to us. And by the time it got to us and we opened it, it was so raggedy. And you didn't want to touch it because it, it smells like poop. And you're just like, ugh. But you read it, and there's the person. He's on one of my boy's yards, and his name was Cowboy from Ventura. All right? Now, usually the way they would do this and they would select these people, the way the AB would do it is they will find somebody who usually has life in prison with no possibility or someone who's in the mix and has aspirations or skinheads like myself who can't say no. Skinheads, our politics are different. We're not allowed to say no. We cannot say no or we're going to get repercussions as well. So we are frontline soldiers and we're going to be treated as such, and those are our standards. And we're, and especially being Peni, even more so. So there's an individual that has some paperwork on him from way back to where he had one of his nieces, and it came out on paperwork. And this dude had like an old school E number and had been slipping through the cracks for a long time, and it caught up with him. And it landed on the worst person's yard because that dude, Cowboy, was a lifer, and he was just brand new in prison, and he hadn't even earned his bones yet. When you first come in on a life sentence in prison, you're expected to earn your bones. And when you're a lifer, that means murder, or you're going to try to murder that dude. And if he survives, he survives, but it's a murder hit. You earn your bones immediately. Usually within the first couple years, your hand's raised. You're a lifer. You get the job done. You go make your round. You go meet the brothers in the shoe. They tell you thank you. You receive your credentials. And then when you get kicked out of the shoe or wherever you are from, if you don't get validated, then you have a little bit of rank if you're not a gang member on the next yard that you go to. And you can pretty much take yards because you're now trusted and you're doing the ultimate sacrifice because that's the way they do it. That's the whether the AB tests you, it's the ultimate sacrifice. If you're down to kill somebody for them and sacrifice your life for them, you're either going to catch a life sentence or you're going to die. That's it. It's a fork in the road. It's a rock in a hard spot. You're going to do it or not. Well, let me tell you something. This boy picked up the job. And the way that the orders go over and pass, they're very subtle. Okay, When you receive these type of instructions, this isn't something that's considered this is this is fragile mail. This is hot mail, and it has to be dealt with a certain fashion. And you can't just write any kite to anybody. You have to make sure that this person gets the word, and the kite made it to him. You can't rewrite the kite. You have to make sure that that kite gets to that person so they know that it's legit and it's stamped by the Aryan Brotherhood. That's when you know it's real. If not... You rewrite the kite, usually there's going to be second guessing. By that time, somebody ends up leaving. The job has to get done, okay? And the repercussions of getting a murder kite and fumbling it, sorry to say, bro, you receive that man's punishment, and now you're the target. That's what's going to happen, especially if he gets away. So you are not allowed to fumble with these type of things. These are career-ending or career-breaking type of deals, okay? So we get the word over to Cowboy. And he's over on B Yard in Calipat at this time. And then we get the touchdown. So nothing is going to happen until you get the touchdown and verification that he received word, and it's a go. Then you're just waiting. And the way that these instructions went to him, and you can kind of say, you know, I've incriminated, I've incriminated myself on these stories, but a lot of this is all common knowledge, and this is just experiences that have happened in prison back then on how people would – earn their bones and how people were living life. This is an everyday thing. Every day in prison, somebody's dying and somebody's catching a life sentence. That's what's up in this lifestyle, whether it's on the streets or prison. So he gets it and he sends word to us that he got it and it's a go. Okay. Now we were debating. So us in, in the political circle, I was a kid, but one of my older homeboys, Animal Mike McMillan, would keep me informed on everything because I was his little soldier, and I need to be in the know at all costs because I'm, I'm I'm a trusted person, and I've seen the kite. My eyes have seen the kite. Therefore, I'm reliable too, and I'm responsible for it as well. And now we're just waiting to see what happens. And what happened was is this. So you have 60 seconds remaining. This guy who was in trouble was starting to get a little bit sketchy because he knew he had been running for something, and that's never good. All right, I'm calling you back, all right? 
So we got the verification that everything was in motion, everything's good. And now the orders, see back then, what's crazy is even when you're dropping out, there's certain attacks and there's certain ways when a, a hit goes down where you know that it's ordered by the Aryan Brotherhood. Now these days, you know it's ordered by the Aryan Brotherhood if they have one person holding you why the other person is digging you out, okay? If they think you're capable of it, they'll send one lifer that way that they don't have to use two. They'll use one lifer who is big enough and capable of enough because they've assessed this man among their peers. They selected him from the shoe, and now the face in him. Everything's up to this man. Well, they picked the right person, okay, because this dude, Cowboy, I know him real well. So once we got that go, there was instructions for him to use a certain type of knife because, like I said, it's a murder hit. A murder hit, you don't want a person to be out there stabbing the dude a million times. There's vital spots to be able to hit a man to take him out, and that was on the kite itself. On the kite itself, it literally explained that they wanted him stabbed in his heart. They wanted his heart to stop. There was no gray area. Some people, when they receive those, they'll, they'll fumble it by thinking that means just stab him a bunch of times until his heart stops, and then they end up coming up short, and they're all in trouble. So when we got these orders to stop his heart, it was a heart shot. That's what they mean. That's the translation. Go right into a shot. Now, they design a certain type of knife, so what you do is, and the way that the orders go down is you, you wait till you have your good moment and you take your opportunity and you run it in. You don't sit here and be foolish and start panicking and just grab whatever. The next thing you know, this dude's starting to know whatever's going on. And that's exactly what happened. And then that's how mistakes happen. A person has to have a real poker face. You have to, when it comes down to these things, because this man knew he was running from something, and he was starting to get skittish because you can tell when they're putting together a hit. I know this from personal experience. Just by watching the body language of everybody, the way they start treating you, it's different. Psychologically messing with you. You can tell because you hang out with these people every single day. So we got word that this dude is starting to feel some type of way. His skeletons were surfacing, and we're like, dude, you need to handle this. You need to handle this as aggressive as you possibly can, and you need to go get the sharpest knife and go get it off of an L bracket on a kitchen cart and have a kitchen worker bring it out immediately. And we, and, and mind you, one of these little L brackets can be up to a foot long. And where the heart is placed at, you don't have to have it a foot long. It just has to be sharp and constructed enough to where it's secure, to where it doesn't bend and go straight to the heart and pops it. It's a one-shot type of deal as long as you have the right tool to do it. So that was the orders that was given. So they did that. Once they got the L bracket popped off, they sent word right over that they got it and it was going to be done. The orders were to get it done overnight. A piece like that, when you're constructing a fatal hit knife, it only takes one night to do. And the way you do it is... As you find a rough spot on your ground. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. <laughs> and you pour a little bit of water on the ground so that it doesn't grab and it's nice and slippery. And as long as you put a lot of back arm into it, you will have a nice constructed kill knife by morning time. And usually a person in a celly will take turns. You can get these things as sharp as a razor. You can literally get these things as sharp as a box cutter. But we're not looking for a box cutter. We're looking for something that's going to be smooth like butter into this man's heart. Then we got the green light. It was done. So the knife was constructed. The, the, and the person that's usually on the job to construct the weaponry is going to be someone who has experience in doing that, someone that knows what they're doing. You're not going to have some rookie on the job. You're going to have a seasoned veteran who knows what they're doing in order to get the job done. That's the way these little targets go. So it gets done. It's the next yard. Like I said, this thing had to be done immediately before this dude gets away because 100% he's starting to act weird now. And what I mean by weird is he's keeping his distance from the woodpile. He's not coming out like he's supposed to. 
so that's when it puts you into a position where a white person might have to call a mandatory yard. And a mandatory yard is to make sure that everybody's out there. But when they do that type of thing, the person that's in trouble already knows that the mandatory yard is for him. And you don't want it to get there. You want this to be nice and subtle, smooth, calm, cool, and collected, get the job done, and be done. Okay? So it's morning yard. They canceled it that day. The day that it was supposed to be canceled, the day it was supposed to happen that morning, they canceled it and ended up searching all around the whites' areas looking for knives. Fortunately, we had it in a certain hiding spot that they wouldn't find, but we knew that somebody had dropped some sort of dime that something was going to happen. So we checked on it. How many people have known about this? Nobody. Other than you and the person making it, who knows? Nobody. Okay, so then it must be that person pretty much telling the cops to check the area to make sure that he's safe when he goes out to yard. And that's what that was all about. So the next morning, they ran it, and that was the day. So they come out to yard, and when you come out to yard, you initially you go straight over to the whites area to the table that's ours. The one that we have established is ours. You go to the table, but everybody knows that the whites table is treacherous, and you don't want to group around. Anybody who knows they're in trouble is not just going to go put themselves in a situation and go turn their back to a bunch of whites at the whites table. But that's the formalities when you're an active white person in the state of California. You have to go there to do a, um, a supplement roll call, make sure all the whites are out there that are supposed to be out there. So they did that, and they all shook hands, and that's when Cowboy had to befriend the dude. Now, here's the thing. Cowboy was selected not only because of how big he was and him being a lifer, it was because he was a likable dude and this person would least expect it from him. That's how that works. And that's how it usually goes down is the person's closest to him, the one that can get close enough to do it, is going to be the person to do it. That goes for all. That's just the way it is in the game. And that's what they did. So Cowboy was using his charisma, whatever you want to call it, his manipulation skills, and he takes him over, and they're talking, and he's leading them so far off track. This guy is feeling so comfortable being around Cowboy. And now he's going wherever he wants him to go. He's got him at the palm of his hand, and he walks him and lure his, lures him right over inside the weight pile. Now, in Calipatria, the way it's set up, the weight pile, a lot of hits go down there because it's right under their nose. The gun tower is above the weight pile, right in the middle of where it separates both yards because there's a fence right down the middle of the yard separating four and five blocks and one, two, and three blocks. And the gunner cannot look everywhere all at once, so they do it right under their nose, and they usually cause distractions on the other side of the yard to get the cops' attention away from them. This was all set up to perfection, and that's what happened. The only thing is is that... Somebody had dropped dime, and the cops were a little bit on it, so this was going to be more of a kamikaze mission. Rather than trying to get away with it, at this point, cops knew about it. They searched it. He's a lifer. He's not even tripping. So as soon as he gets his opportunity, he's taking it. And as soon as he sees the cops, uh, what he thought the cop was looking away, but the cop was wearing sunglasses, so he okie doked him, and he took out that knife, and the dude that he was hanging next to that was in trouble wasn't even looking, and he took that knife, and he plunged it right into his heart and popped it one shot. As he did this, okay, anybody who's seen anything like this, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. It's not something easy to absorb. I don't care if you're the person standing next to him or the person on the yard, just the whole action in Post hit, even post hit, it really just leaves chills up your whole body. But he thought he got away with it, but he didn't. And the cop seen it the whole time, turns around with the mini 14 and hits him with a 223 bullet, boom, right into his chest. Explodes his right there in the middle of the yard. He lays flat on his back. The paramedics are coming out and they are in some severe panic mode because they have one person who just got shot, a fatal hit right into his stomach with a, with a mini-14 bullet, and another dude who's not moving on the yard. He's literally a slab of meat who's gushing out of his left side of his chest, which was his heart. Okay? He got the job done. He ended up getting caught for it, homicide, busted, dead in the right. And then this dude ended up, his cowboy ended up, getting a colostomy bag because it tore out his insides 
his intestines were literally falling out of his stomach and they were trying to put his intestines back in This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. On the yard to save this man's life. Luckily, they do have a good response team, and that's the only way they save this life, man, or he just had a fight in him where he didn't want to die because not too many people survive survive a bullet like that straight. And let me tell you something. The distance between the tower to where he got shot is only about 50 feet. So you can pretty much say it wasn't point-blank range, but it was enough to do some real damage. But Cowboy, after that post-hit, He's forever in a colostomy bag. He will never be right again. He cannot use the restroom anymore. He cannot eat solid food anymore. His whole in, uh, injustice system is all messed up. His internal organs do not function properly. That dude got killed. He sacrificed his life. He'll never get out of prison. Cowboy ended up getting validated for this as a direct hit from the Aryan Brotherhood and ended up getting in trouble later on down the road for some nonsense and everything that he did for them was for nothing. So I hope that everybody feels what I'm talking about on this story and enjoy this little experience at 8 o'clock at night in Soledad. Thank you.